You are listening to the Mary Jane Society podcast, where you will meet entrepreneurs, cultivators, scientists, doctors, and inventors in the cannabis industry. I'm your host, Pam Schmiel, marketer and publicist in the cannabis industry. Huffco has dominated the hash space with its cutting edge hardware for over 10 years. Today we meet Chelsea Kossauer, their VP of Global Expansion, to learn how she's elevating the hash culture around the world and spreading the Puffco brand by building community. Let's welcome Chelsea to the show. I thought we could just start with what is your role as VP of Global Expansion at Puffco and and what are your primary responsibilities? I thought we'll just launch it with that. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, yeah. first off, thank you for taking the time to want to hear my story and give <laughs> us a platform. So really awesome for you to do that. Mm-hmm. Um, my name is Chelsea Kossauer. I was the first employee at Puffco and I have really done everything from intern to sales rep to sales manager, growing to the VP of sales and business development. And then most recently, about a year ago, a little longer than a year ago, um, I saw in partnership with our CEO and CRO, the opportunity of the global market. Mm-hmm. And Roger looked at me and he's like, oh, you have to do globally what you did here. Like, go build. And um, Mm -hmm. for the past year and a half, uh, I managed to build an incredibly talented team. They're the best. Like I, without them, you know, I I can't imagine we'd be in as many countries as we are. And um, my job, I guess my role is to find uh, any place in the world that has hash culture and work with partners in that geo to accelerate hash culture. So, for example, uh, we heard that Thailand was a really big market and there's growing and there's a culture there, uh, but the laws are still kind of a a gray area. So we went there because there was an event and we managed to meet some of the most incredible hash makers that have been doing it for years, but it's just such a smaller market. And we brought our CEO, Jolly Roger, who does this YouTube channel, and he basically goes into these markets and films the ins and outs of <clears throat> the hash culture from the past into the future. And we were able to go there and see that there's a hash culture in Thailand, in Asia, that you could walk into a legal dispensary and find hash. And that just melted our brain. Um, but yeah, finding, oh. finding hash markets. <laughs> oh, that that's so interesting. Well, okay. So I, I'm going to jump to this question then. And that yeah. is, uh, I feel like I could be wrong. Um, I'm on the East coast. So I feel like we always get things behind the West coast, but, um, do you, th- I feel like hash is kind of making maybe a comeback, but I feel like oh, it's yeah. as far as like all the different innovative ways to process, you know, we for hash, um, and so I guess I'd like, what do you think about that? Is there's this new, uh, era almost Yeah, new era hash has been around. Um, yeah. So and I think, I think this is important for people to understand, right? Hash did not start in the U S and I think that a lot of the time we get so stuck in our bubble, like our domestic bubble, where we think, you know, typical mindset is like, we know everything, we made everything, everything comes from us. When really hash comes from places like Morocco and India. And um, I think it's really important sometimes for us to realize like we, hash didn't come from the US. Um, Mm -hmm. So that being said, I think what excites me the most and Puffco the most about hash is all of the room for innovation, where they have able to take something and really do a lot of incredible things in the curing process and the extraction process to innovate that category. Um, When you look at growing cannabis, right, um, there's a bunch of different techniques and ways to do it to make it better, but it's still growing the cannabis, right? With hash, people are able to play with different extraction methods. People are able to take solvents and actually figure out how to remove solvents and make some of the purest, healthiest part of the plant. And I think that's what's um, driving kind of this uh, new wave because 
people who are obsessed with growing can now take that art form and translate it into um, a hash jar. And I think that's really cool. Well, I mean, because there's certain types of weed or strains that are good for hash, right? Is that kind of what you're saying? Like I don't know too much about this because I work on the hardware side, but mm -hmm. uh, my best friend owns a hash and cannabis company, Feeling Frosty. Um, mm -hmm. She's uh, a co-founder with her partner, Madison, but she is obsessed with this up to a science where I... Um, I was hanging, we were hanging out, we were smoking and she was like working on her computer. And I look and there's all these Excel sheets of percentages and like calculations. And I'm like, what is this? She's like, oh, these are all of our genetics and these are how they wash. And, mm -hmm. you know, like, uh, and I said to her, you know, like we just finished a jar or something. I'm like, why don't you have more of this? And she's like, that's personal stuff. We would never do that on a large stream because it, the yields aren't great. Look. And I was just like, Phew. so you have yeah. plants like GMO? Those wash really, really heavy, very high yield. Mm, mm. Okay, yeah, I, right. It's right the high yield and what what you can get out of them. But, but you're saying, you know, we should remember that hash doesn't come from the United States, but we just always seem to be innovating. I know, kind of, it's a new industry taking off, but I feel like you know we we lead in innovation um and uh, do you see that from what you're seeing you know what we're producing here in the united states i mean we're just really getting started yeah i think it's yes and no if that makes sense because hash did come from another place um but like you said you know we have taken that and then we've figured out new techs and new ways to extract and new ways and new temperatures new way uh different uh, temperatures to press the rosin. Uh, people are innovating, you know, newer bags. You know, Mila the Hash Queen makes her own bubble bags and machines like that. Um, mm. Most recently, a really exciting almost, I, I don't want, not experiment, it more happened organically, but the impact it had um, was, was mind blowing. So uh, there is a very small dispensary that I'm gonna put on your list or a, a club. He's, it's called Uncle's Farms. Okay. Okay. It's not a big club. Like you won't go there and like really sit and hang out. It has some of the best hash in the world, in my opinion. No, really. No, re really. So he does something called Piatella. And hmm. this is Uncle Farms Tech. And he essentially takes water hash and he cold cures it for months, weeks or months. But it's interesting concept, right? Because most people, as soon as it washes and they want to get it as fresh as possible to the customer he's curing it. So when you open it, it's this like moist, succulent, almost cake, but the terps on it are like un anything I've ever tasted. It, it was um, something I've never seen before in a long time because after uh, rosin and cold curing rosin, for the past two years, there hasn't been a lot of innovation in hash. Like you, you saw in like... Um, rosin really kind of take over the past three years yeah three, yeah. three years but yeah. after that there hasn't been any innovation there's cold cure there's you know water water hash yeah. so uh roger covered this and i'll send you the video link of the piatella and he's like guys this is incredible the video was viewed almost seven hundred thousand times it made such an impact that the u.s hash makers were now scrambling to try and make piatella so now all the people are making Piatella in the USA, selling it in stores, doing competition, selling it. I saw Piatella in South Africa. Like, I, I, that popped up on my radar too. And I completely forgot about it until you just mentioned it. Yes. Um, but what is the difference? I mean, it's, what is it cured? It's like, it's like wait. similar, um, again, apologize to uncle if I'm misrepresenting in any way from my understanding and again I'm, I'm want to reiterate I'm not an expert on the Piatella process yes it's similar to when you would like um keep a fine wine right like you let it age you let it cure okay. so it's an account you know? so it's basically just curing and you know you have to keep it for a long period of time you can't like put it for three days and then open it like blew my mind in a sense of the product and the impact it had to the point where Uncle's Farms Piatella is now being like sold, is now being, you know, 
the the tech and like the foils to do it like it, it that one event uh was a catalyst for pushing the hash culture into an innovative state and that's really incredible and shout out to jolly roger for making that happen <laughs> um, okay so you're, you're saying he made it happen because he he was kind of scouring the earth looking for different i want to i want to say yeah, I wouldn't say he made it happen. I think he and his platform were able to get the visibility of Uncle's Farms products and the hash makers that would partner with Uncle's Farms um, to an audience that maybe wouldn't have been able to see it before, causing people to start thinking differently and asking questions, which I think is the goal for any any piece of uh, media. So it had a really positive impact. So uh, that's something I'm really thankful that Puffco invests in that media and in that educational uh, content in different parts of the world, because, you know, somebody who follows Roger that might not ever have the means to travel to Thailand, but that doesn't mean they're not extremely passionate about what's going on over there. And the stories that we're able to cover and we're able to see, like, you're not finding that. The stories that we're hearing, the people we're talking to, the farms that we're visiting, almost like the border of Vietnam, like, you can't yeah. find that on that geo. Are there other products out there like Puffco? How are they, how, are, are, you know, what is your competition on the global front? Really good question. I think um, right now, currently, Puffco has kind of created our own category and, and set that standard. So we've been doing this since 2013, you know, over almost over 10 years. Um, so as far as competition, there's been a lot that have come and gone and tried to, you know, like copy the innovation that we've done. Uh, most of them, you know, don't, don't make it a few years just because it's really easy to copy one thing, but we have so many ideas and designs that by the time they get one thing, we're already innovating to the next. Um, I'd like to consider Puffco the apple of the space where one thing I really love about an iPhone is it makes everything so simple for you in your hand, where there's no like, oh, I have to do this, I have to do that. It's like, oh, I have to send a message. Oh, I have to make a call. And it makes doing everyday tasks that could be really hard, really, really simple. And that's what Puffco tries to be, is we try to be a device that does all the thinking for you and we just make consumption really, really easy. If we do our jobs right, you're not thinking about the product in your hand, you're only thinking about what's going inside. I, I only see I only see the hash market growing because you know as 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 the you know global legalization happens because you know of its kind of purity uh, it's a luxury product you know I, I mean so um, and and everyone loves it it's it's only going to grow as a category as so so talking about like the global uh, marketplace what. How so? You just started kind of attacking the global market, uh, like you said, a year and a half ago. Where did where did your when did your global sales start? In which countries did you really first launch in? Our global sales started honestly very very early. We uh, started selling into Canada, uh, like in two thousand thirteen, two thousand and fourteen. Um, after that, we were able to form an early partnership with Spanibus. So we have actually been sponsoring and attending Spanibus since 2015. Spain was one of the first markets we really invested in. It was one of the first markets from the revenue side that we hire employees and, and team members that live in Barcelona. Um, so I think that was our uh, biggest culture investment was Spain and starting sales and partnerships in Europe. So basically, so really, it's not even so much your role to be like a salesperson, you know, trying to sell or push your e-com sales. I guess that's mostly what you're, you have probably, right, is e-commerce sales because, or or I guess uh, just. Uh, uh, actually, opposite, right, actually opposite right now. So internationally, you, it's available to receive via company uh, on our website, but shipping is very expensive. So we're working on some solutions to get our international direct-to-consumer up and running this year. That's a goal. Um, but right now, uh, 100% of our global sales are retail. Oh, okay. And are those like smoke shops? I guess, obviously, they can't be dispensaries. I mean, they Not 100%, maybe like 98%. But um, it depends on the market, right? You know, in Spain, there could be head shops, there could be cannabis clubs, 
in places like Chile, you know, it could be e-commerce stores in places like, um, you know, South Africa, they're in uh, cafes, they're in stores, places like Australia, they're in, sold in some pharmacies. Mm -hmm. So it really depends on the market and uh, what, type, uh, what type of retail outlets are in those specific markets. Some, some markets are e-commerce heavy where we sell to a distribution partner and they sell to their clients or we'll sell to a website and they'll sell to their clients. Okay. So, um, where do you see the, the biggest or the most concentrated hash culture or the biggest hash culture? And then where, where, where do you see an emerging hash culture coming up that wasn't really there before? That's like, so you see the most. That's yeah, so I mean, it, listen, it's so global, the whole no, thing. No, no, no. You know why? If you would have asked me that a year ago, I would have, without hesitation, said Spain. I would have said Spain, uh, and most of the Spanish, uh, most of the hash in Spain are from Italian hash makers, which is really funny. Mm -hmm. um, but now after exploring South America, there is, there's some fire in South America. And, ha, huh, I don't know. I, cause Spain is a country and South America is a continent. But I might say, South America might have a more concentrated. That's really hard. You just blew my brain. <laughs> just okay. blew my brain. No, no. I mean, honestly, you know, people are, are everywhere. I was just curious if there was something pretty obvious, but you, you did, you know, over in Europe, you are saying, you know, Spain uh, versus say Germany or, you know. Yes, definitely that. But you know, what's interesting is everyone was sleeping on South America and there's so many people there. And I just think that's so interesting. And I, you look at Mexico, Mexico has so many people and there's so much hash there and there's so much flour there. Chile, um, you know, I was blown away. Not only is my, is my wife from Chile, who is a grower and hash maker, but when I went there, I saw some of the best hash I've ever seen in my life. So it's like, <laughs> you're right. I feel like people aren't really talking about South America. It's not, I mean, I, there are a few people I do know, you know, uh, you know, a brand that seems to be, you know, tipping in, tiptoeing into South America. But yeah, it, it just always feels like Europe is is what everyone's talking about. Uh, I don't know why that is. South America. Everyone's afraid of South America. It's been in great. I realized this as I, as I fell in love and married somebody from South America and I spent more time there, I started realizing how programmed we were to think like how Our dangerous South like, yeah, I was just going to say cartel. Yeah, you're right. Maybe it's the danger, danger, danger. Yeah, Chile, for example, is like one of the best, uh, best off economic countries. They have like some of the best infrastructure, doctors, people I've ever met. But even before I went there, I'm like, am I going to be safe? Do they have Wi-Fi? Brazil has almost the same amount. We have to look this up. Almost mm -hmm. the same amount of people as the United States. And they're all smoking hash. Brazil's 215. That's a lot of people. That is a lot of people. You know, and they're smoking hash and they're smoking flour. And it's a whole culture that we know nothing about. So and sorry. everybody's growing themselves, I guess. Yeah, I guess a lot of people are growing seen. themselves. A lot of people, and that's that's the coolest part. Sorry, I'm very passionate yeah. and excited about this. The yeah. coolest part of Chile, in my opinion, was there's this company, Resina Company. And he was one of the first people that brought Puffco to Chile, um, but he started selling and making these small rosin presses. So people were and uh, people were able to grow their cannabis themselves and then make their own hash. So there is this huge culture uh, in Chile of single source where they're growing their own cannabis, they're pressing it with and making their own hash, and they care so much about it. Like they care about the flower, they're obsessed with it. And it's very rare to find a single source market that's not, you know, um, from experienced hash makers with a bunch of money to do. Yeah. And single source meaning they grow everything, they do everything themselves, they're using organic soil, like cleaning the water. It was, it was, it was, it was cool. So if you're sleeping on South America, check it out. Jolly Roger on YouTube did a bunch of coverage on Chile and Colombia. Jolly Roger. Yeah. Okay. 
really yeah. cool, um, really great content there. And and what do you happen to know? Like, what is the basic uh, legal uh, landscape down there right now? I mean, who is anything terrible? It's very, it's very, um, it's a gray area. So like, okay, uh, you can have a prescription in Chile to have cannabis on you, and but I went to a trade show there, and listen to how scary this was. The police was stopping every car that was going in and taking their license and search the car. So I'm in the, I'm, I don't, my, mi español es muy mal. So <laughs> I get out of the car and they're like, get out of the car. And then took all of our cannabis out. And I also don't speak Spanish. And thank God that my wife was able to get me papers, but we couldn't find them right away. So one of my teammates ran to meet me and was to speak Spanish and showed the police my papers. And they let us keep all of the hash, all of the flowers and let us go. But, you know, like if we didn't have those papers, we could have been went to jail. And most recently, there's a woman, um, her name is Betty. I've heard about that. Betty is a, is a, is a friend of ours. And unfortunately, um, she's currently in jail for cannabis and hash and is awaiting trial. There's a GoFundMe um, in Nicotee's bio, who's her, who's her husband. Um, but it's, it's, it's a reality check, right? We're blessed to be traveling around the world and exploring these. And there's people that have really pushed the culture that are sitting behind bars for it. And it's really sad. Oh man, that's, t is she American? No, she is Chilean and she mm -hmm. is married to Nika T who um, is another famous hash maker educator. And um, yeah, she was unfortunately caught with some cannabis and now is behind bars just waiting for a trial already has lawyers on it, but it's humbling, right? It's it's a good reminder that you, of our privilege that we have to, um, I, I personally live in California. If I wanted to, I could grow six plants, you know what I mean? Whereas you get caught with six plants in Chile or another place that you don't have the papers for, you go to jail for a very long time and it's very sad. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. I did hear about that. Wow. That's really bad. Yeah. Um, so what about um, your I was just wondering if you could maybe elaborate a little bit more on your, you know, collaborations and partnerships. How are you partnering with people, I guess, influencers or, or hash makers? And how does that how does that work? Like um, For us, the most important thing is that we are platforming the people that are making the best hash. It's not about us. It's about them. So yeah. if there is a hash maker that is taking the risks and pushing the education and the innovation forward in their market, we just want to connect them with gifts. And we're just like, hey, we love what you're doing here, you know, and we don't ask for anything in return. We don't ask for posts. There's no contracts. We go into a market and we will throw an event where we invite all the hash makers. We mm -hmm. give them product. We let, we ask them questions. We allow them to ask us questions. If they're comfortable with it, we put them on camera and platform their brand. We usually blur faces out. Um, and then we tell them and we're like, hey, it's, we're having fun now, but you now, like whether you like it or not, you have a responsibility to keep innovating and pushing the culture forward. People look at you. They see what you're doing, whether you like it or not. Sorry, you bear this burden that all of us bear of setting a good example. And it's our responsibility to keep accelerating hash culture. Welcome to the partnership. Like you're in this. Right. With us, but, like because right. that's that's what it is, is, you know, we're peanut butter and jelly. It's it's we. Yeah. Yeah. You could you could eat a piece of bread by yourself. You could eat some peanut butter out of the jar by yourself, but when it's together and heated up, oh my God, it's incredible. You can't, it's an unmatched experience. Yeah. Um, so that's what we do as far as the culture. We'll go there and we will really pump up the culture. And, you know, we usually like to go in and support local events and trade shows as well. And from there, we find distribution partners that are already, because if we're going to uh, go and we want to, um, enrich a culture. We want to make sure that people that are interested could also purchase our products if they'd like to. Um, so we'll find a partner that has a good reputation, has good business values, but most importantly, it's not about the money for us. We want to make sure that they understand the importance of the culture. And if they are able to show that to us and we have a meeting with them and they're about also innovating and, and elevating hash culture, that's the partners we tend to, uh, mm -hmm go with as far as distribution and whatnot. And that's kind of what we do. And and what about um 
what do you think or are or are are you guys involved in any hash competitions have you organized any hash competitions and what you know it just seems like maybe i'm wrong but i just feel like there's so many popping up everywhere you yeah. know in the united states anyways but no we don't have a hash cup ourselves but anytime there is a hash cup puffco is a uh, sponsor so oh. we that there's puffcos on the table for the competitors if they want to taste that uh taste you know really taste the terps and not have to light a torch because a lot of these have 60 70 entries so to sit there with the torch oh yeah a lot of butane um not to mention we always make sure that the winners get puffcos of certain events so if there is a big event we'll donate a lot of product to the event that way the winners are who are making the best hash now have a uh a, a way to consume it um most recently, uh, we are sponsors of the Eagle Clash, which is the biggest um, cup in the world. You have to be invited. You can't just come. Uh, mm -hmm. So you can't just compete. You have to be invited to compete, which means that like people are watching what you're doing. They're suggesting you. Um, and Masters of Rosin is both happening at the same time in Spain. So really excited. Um, I'm a judge for Masters of Rosin. So really oh, excited. Cool. Yeah. Um, fun. <laughs> yeah, right? A lot of entries. Um, and then my other favorite one is the Emerald Cup. I mean, Tim and Taylor do mm -hmm. such an incredible job highlighting and, and organizing that cup of that scale, too. Does Puffco have any plans of going outside of hash, expanding just into, you know, dry flour? Or why did why was it why did it start with really just hash? Because really, if, if you started what you said in 2015 or, or 13, 2012, 2013. Well, yeah. So that's kind of feels like, well, you know, way before it was becoming very popular, obviously, because it was so underground. So what was the reasoning behind just specifically hash, which I think today it's going to work out really well because <laughs> so neat, um, you know. Um, we truly believe hash is the future. It's the healthiest way to consume cannabis. Um, don't get me wrong. We're not saying smoking flour is unhealthy, uh, but we just prefer and believe that what we're putting into our bodies is um should be healthy. You know, we're, we're health freaks. Uh, again, I like flour. I smoke flour, um, every day, but I mostly consume with hash in my opinion, taste better. The, um, psychoactive effects are, um, intense, but then they go away quickly. I'm not left with that, like burnt feeling where I'm like, Oh, I want to sleep and, um, things, things like that. Uh, and the best analogy I can really give you is if you want to bake a cake, uh, I don't know if you like to bake, but if you want to bake a cake, uh, you won't take the vanilla plant and grind it up and throw it in your cake batter. You're going to take the best and purest form of the vanilla plant, which is vanilla extract, and you're going to put a few drops in your in your batter and you're going to cook it. So that's kind of a similar analogy to hash, in my opinion, is the purest concentrated form of the plant. It's all the stuff that we want in a beautiful little jar that smells and tastes like cherries or, you know. Laffy Taffy's. It's beautiful. yeah, yeah. Okay, so you're you're sticking to hash. Good yeah, idea. I mean, we tried. Uh, like, uh, we actually made a prototype of a dry herb vape, and Puffco doesn't do things for money. We know we could have made um a ton of money. This was years ago. Uh, it wasn't better than what was currently on the market. So mm -hmm. why put something out that's not better than the current experience available? So we made the decision that if there's ever a way, but we just also don't believe that vaporizing flour is the best way to consume it. Mm. So because we don't believe in it, we're not going to try and profit off of it and make something. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. And so, um, you know, given like what just happened in Germany and steps towards, you know, global legalization or, or in Europe, um, and, and you've seen so many different well, really, there's no brands in the marketplace like there is in the U.S., but like for the for U.S. brands to start thinking about or, or uh, you know, entering the European market, um, it's a little early for them. But do you have any advice for entrepreneurs uh, looking to enter and try to, you know, get their brand awareness in a, you know, they, they can't go in now, but are there are there just ways you think they could start building their brand uh, recognition in, in these upcoming markets? Absolutely. I'll give them the same advice my um, European distro gave to me. 
And I laugh about it now because at the time I was like, okay. And now I'm like, oh my God, he was so right. And he never lets me forget it. Um, <laughs> if you come into Europe acting like an American company, you will fail. Great. And well, because cultural differences, that's what I was, wa- is that what you're talking about or? Just everything, you know, like America. And I think I realized this more as I travel. Don't, it's not like I hate America, you know, I'm very, very, you know, happy to be very privileged to be here, but Americans definitely have this sense of entitlement. They have this sense of, I need to do this now. Screw, you know, Europe is like, it's three o'clock. Go yeah, that's a- right. It's so You true. know what I mean? So like, and you, like, you can't call a European distro and be like, hey, where's da 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 And they're like, yo, I am having a cappuccino. Like, you need to, I am like, you need to fucking relax. Oh, and- buddy. Oh so my they, God. It's that's our, like, they're like, I'll call and he's like, Hey, it's August. I'm about to go on vacation for two weeks. What are you, why, why are you calling me? I'm in, uh, the Canary islands. I'm like, Gabriel, we're launching. And he's like, I'll call you in two weeks. It's, it's, you know what I mean? So it's, uh, it's like, interesting. Uh, interesting. Yeah. So my best advice is you don't, in, unless you have somebody like you don't understand, I'm so blessed to have, an employee in Barcelona who's also a very good friend of mine. Her name is um, Juliana. She's mm-hmm. like our secret sauce. And she'll tell me, I'll be like, Julie, we have to get that. She's like, girl, we are not getting anything until tomorrow morning. Like, you know, maybe before you go to sleep, we'll get an answer, but they're eating dinner right now. Like it's, you're, they're not, he's not going to answer your email. So. Oh my um, gosh. Just learn the European cultures. There's a great book actually that my coach recommended oh it's called the culture map the co- oh the culture oh okay and it gives you um de- uh decoding how people think lead and get things done across cultures fantastic i really love great it. book really great book because and, and you know how i operate in Spain is very different than how I operate in uh, Brazil or how I operate in Australia is very different than how I operate in Germany. Right. Great. Great. Yeah. So that's great. So from a business perspective. Yeah. Um, and then how about just from a uh, well, I guess you have to learn your culture, who, what, what market you're trying to enter to see, <laughs> you know, if your flavors line up or, you know, whatever, yeah. you know, that kind of stuff to, to the culture. I guess that just kind, kind and- of kind of. Europeans love European brands. So like um, Dynavape, which is not a big brand here, huge in Europe. Stores and Bickle, huge in Europe. One of the biggest vaporizers because they're from, they're a German company. Um, Mm -hmm. Roar, Glass, you know, everybody has Roar pieces because they're a German company. So German, um, not German, Europeans, all like, that's another thing we forget is they don't need the U.S. to come in and save them. They have a culture. They have some, honestly, Barcelona has, and Germany even, has probably the same level of hash available in a market, uh, not the legal market, but available in market than some of these states. So, you know, it's, uh, and I think so, that was the big lesson for me. But you're right. We feel like, oh, we want to go running over. And it's more like, I feel like it's more of, we just want to get, you know, you want to expand into the global marketplace, you know? Um, So, uh, but uh, otherwise a lot more companies would be doing it. It's expensive, very expensive. And the return it's, it's, it's a wait, you know, we've invested an incredibly sweating a little bit, an incredible (laughs) amount of money into the global cannabis market. And we didn't know if we were going to get it back. We didn't know. We didn't care. We know it's what needed to happen. Mm. Well, you know, it's funny because I was thinking, you know, I've just been thinking of different ways how brands can go, you know, get in there. And I was thinking, well, licensing, you know, say, for instance, you're a really well-established brand, not ancillary, but, you know, products, Mm -hmm. CPG products. And. But, you know, maybe based on what you're saying that it's it's like, listen, you know, they have they already have like their brand or they're building their brands over there or they want to be loyal to, to the Europeans. So maybe that isn't such a thing. But but we do have other things I feel like that could really benefit them, our, our expertise or innovation that we've kind of perfected, because, you know, like machinery, 
Um, exactly. Or, you know, even in Puffco innovation, you yes. know, our market has been open. Like we can openly now, you know, pretty much uh, innovate and, and we're manufacturing. So, you know, like things like um, infused pre-roll machines, you know, we have to, we have to customize and build machinery to adapt to this industry that's new, that we're developing a whole manufacturing, uh, you know, around. And the biggest export we have is culture. I mean, that's something that we bring when we do come to a place and. Okay. What's our culture? What do we bring? We bring this level of every country is looking at the U S in terms of fashion, Oh. Uh, streetwear, art, music, cannabis direction. You know, that's why when you go to uh, these places, there's counterfeit cookie bags, there's counterfeit Jungle Boys bags. You know, if you go to these different markets and you're seeing these really big brands there, it's because they're looking at the U.S. for culture. That's so I, I couldn't agree more with you. Yes, you know, we definitely come with innovation like Puffco, like these new yeah. machines. But what we're really coming with is 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 culture where we're coming in and we're like, hey, wow, what you're doing is incredible. This is also what we're doing. And then from there, it's a beautiful kind of merging of yeah, minds. Yeah. I mean, I think I, I, I believe or that's what it should be um, mm -hmm. if you're a company or a brand going into another country is to, like you said, a nice marriage of the two cultural worlds and exactly. let's blend it all together because it's it's a global it's a global movement. So. Um, okay, so wow, that's really great. So I guess just maybe our last question. Um, I guess with, uh, I don't know, maybe I'm not really sure. I'm just trying to tap into what you think the global vision is as, as, as you know, we, we really move towards legalization. Um, um, yeah. But you're tapped into the culture because that's really what you're doing. And let's go market by market, right? Okay. I feel that Canada is progressing on a really great um, like retails front. You know, you have brands like Canna Cabana and things like that, um, but there's not a lot of people there. So the market can only grow as much as as many as there's people there. But there's incredible hash there and experiences. So there's a very healthy cannabis market. You look at Europe, Europe's interesting because Europe's similar to the U.S. where you have places like California, but then you have places like Wyoming. So um, I'm, I think once Germany goes wreck, France will follow and mm. slowly the other European countries will start following suit. Places like the UK already have a medical program. Mm. And so, the, you know, it's, it's going to happen. I think uh, Germany is a big catalyst for other countries to follow for a wreck model. Um, I think that will happen within the next three to five years. Mm -hmm. And I believe that South America in the next three to five years, we'll move more towards a medical, more accessible medical model. Mm. Going. Which is which is good. I like I like that approach. I think that's a really good approach that we should all do that first and bring that in and, and convince people. So, okay, cool. Oh, wonderful. Thank you so much.